On today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, Netflix, which normally kills shows way too early, just greenlit seasons two and three of Avatar The Last Airbender, Obi-Wan, Andor, Moon Knight, Falcon the Winter Soldier. Disney just announced 4K Blu-ray physical media releases of these things. How does that make sense? We're going to discuss that because Rob's here. Uh -huh. Disney CEO <laughs> Bob Iger has confirmed that they have quietly and secretly been killing off some movie projects following a trend that's going on in Hollywood. And sadly and unfortunately, James Gunn has been let it known that he and Superman will not be at Comic-Con this year. Why not? We're going to talk about that and a few things more. The John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet, the John Campus Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio, I got Ray Ora. Hey, what's up, everyone? Jonathan Voiko's here. Hello. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett is here. How's it going? And most <laughs> importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making the show part of your day. Here's how the show's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I just listed off. And then in the second part of the show, we're going to turn it over to you and take your live comments and questions. If you guys have a thought, theory, question, opinion, observation that you'd like us to address, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat. They are open right now, but we don't keep them open for too terribly long. So get it in fairly soon. And we will address those as long as they're appropriate to be used on our show in the second part of the show. All right, guys. I want to let you know about this, though. Uh, yesterday, uh, you guys, I'm Canadian. Didn't know if you knew that. I, mm. I kind of keep that a secret. I'm, I'm very quiet about my Canadianness. Uh, but I'm a big Canadian, and I love my hockey. So uh, last night, Ann and I went to the LA Kings versus the good Canadian team, Vancouver Canucks. All right. Because they were playing. And we were actually sitting... We ended up sitting. I didn't realize this when I bought the ticket. We're right behind the bench. So I started getting messages from some people uh, during the game on my phone saying, are you at the LA King game? I'm like, yeah. And they sent me this picture. Uh, <laughs> they're there. So every time last night that they would go to me, I'd be in that. Some people may be asking, John, why are you wearing an LA Kings jersey if you're at a Canadian team? I was going to wear my Canadian national team jersey. But Ann wouldn't let me. Sucker. Yeah, Ann said, no, you're wearing a King's jersey. That's so like, right. So I wore a King's jersey, and that's fine. But I'm not the only one. I want to share that I, that uh, got on the TV last night, because during the broadcast, during uh, intermission, as they were talking to the analysts, Ann found a way to put herself right in the spotlight. Check out uh, this video that we got sent. If there's the cut. Wait, what was, wait a second. What was that? What a run. <laughs> what a little and, run. And geez. then she wasn't done. Hi. <laughs> you stupid little run. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's, that's, that's Ray's little sister, everybody. My wife, Ann, making her big, big prime time television broadcast across the country. Uh, debut in that. So anyway, we had a lot of fun last night. And thank you to everybody who saw that I was at the game and messaged me during that. You know what? I got to say, that's the Filipino in her. Filipinos always trying to Love find, the spotlight. What, find a way to start them, even little bit or big time. <laughs> we'll find a way, baby. <laughs> um, anyway, so we had a good time last night, and uh, I hope you guys had a wonderful night, too. All right. With that all down, guys, let's get things rolling off with this. You know, Avatar The Last Airbender is now out. And while it has not received universal praise, um, I am now two episodes into it, and I... Like, I'm not this, I admittedly am not the biggest Avatar fan in the world. I, I like the Avatar animated show. I, I quite enjoyed it. But I got to tell you, I'm enjoying the couple of episodes that I've watched so far. And uh, I've been liking it. And the numbers have been good. And apparently Netflix, which is normally in the habit of killing shows like Brother Son with Michelle Yeoh, they just killed it after one season. Very sad. Very sad. That's a really good show. Really good show. But... Not so with Avatar The Last Airbender. They didn't just renew it for another season. They came out and renewed it for two more. This comes just from the folks at Deadline who write the following. 
Avatar The Last Airbender, the anime-inspired live-action series, will be able to tell the story of the four nations, water, earth, fire, air, after Netflix renewed it for a further two seasons. The streamer has handed the show a two-season renewal order to conclude the story of Aang's journey to become the Avatar. It comes after the show premiered on Netflix on February 22nd and recorded, get this, 41.1 million views in its first 11 days, topping its TV list for the last two weeks and being on track to enter its top 10 most watched list over its first three months ever. That's good. So obviously there was all those people out there saying, I'm not going to watch Netflix one if the original creators aren't involved. Well, obviously they lied because they watched. Uh, obviously a lot of people watched and getting a lot of eyeballs on it and, and being at least pretty good is what it takes for Netflix to greenlight something. So they didn't just do the second season. They just came right out and said, we're doing the next two seasons. We're going to complete this story and go from there. I didn't realize the numbers were this good on it, though. Like, that's that's when you start thinking about the number of shows Netflix has had, and they're saying it could crawl into the top ten all time for its first three months. I mean, obviously, you got things like Squid Game up there. Stranger Things is up there, too. But that's pretty impressive. And I'll be honest with you. Whenever I hear Netflix green lighting further seasons, because they green light everything, they just don't always green light second seasons or third seasons. I'm kind of happy and that makes me hopeful for other stuff as well. Anyway, Rob, it didn't happen for Brother's Son, but what do you think about Netflix uh, picking up Avatar for the next two well, seasons? Well, I mean, this is a beloved a c concept, a beloved IP. Yeah. Uh, people love Air The Last Air Bender. It's been around for a long time, people have grown up with it. It doesn't make me surprised in the least that um, it's got these numbers. I would imagine that this this extension or picking it up for seasons two and three was a fait accompli already. I think they already had this plan. I don't disagree. Yeah, because like yeah. when we did when when I was working on Dota Dragon's Blood, the animated series for Netflix, they gave us a three season order. They just didn't announce it because they had to make sure because um, a show like this is logistically difficult. Yeah. So they have to make sure that, and when things with animation, we had a long lead time, so we knew we were going to be involved because it was 18 months from writing to delivery of an episode, so we had to have that time. But in the case of this, it makes sense because, look, they already knew. You know, everyone's looking at analytics these days. They probably looked at their, their whatever their analytics are on want to watch or awareness from the audience. This probably scored amongst the highest they've probably ever seen for something that hadn't gone right. on air yet just because it's so beloved so i think this is a great it's great for the fans it's great for the ip it's great for the show it's great for the creators it's great for the actors nobody loses here and it's apparently great for netflix so. i kind of i kind of <laughs> feel like i don't know if they had predetermined that where they were going to do all three but i think it was more of a case of it was there for Avatar to lose. Like, so, right. look, yes. our plan yes. is to do yes. three. As long as Avatar doesn't come out and everybody hates it and nobody watches it, then we'll do two and three. But I, I sure hope this becomes a little bit more of a trend for Netflix to, to pick up further seasons of good shows like this one. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? Netflix greenlights two further seasons of Avatar, bringing its full story from the animated show to completion. Will they do Korra after that? Who knows? Whatever you guys think, jump into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this. Do you smell it? That death in the air? Oh, yeah, that's physical media. It's been dying at a rapid, uh, rapid decline and pace. And one of the forerunners of <laughs> leading the funeral procession for physical media has been Disney, right? Like they've refuse to put a lot of stuff ever out on disc. There, there are entire territories in the world now that they're not going to be allowing stuff to be released in. It's all part of their big march towards the nothingness that will be the you know disappearance of physical media. But hold on a second. In a new report that just came out, Disney put out a press release saying they have several major titles that they are now putting out on 4K, UHD, and Blu-ray DVD. This comes from Disney's, and their press release said this. The Walt Disney Company today announced four new collector's editions of popular Disney Plus original series from Marvel Studios and Lucasfilm will be available on 4K, UHD, and Blu-ray for fans to add to their collections. These special releases feature steelbook packaging, concept art cards, and some never-before-seen bonus features. The titles, all to be released on April 30th, 2024, are... Marvel Studios, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the complete first season. 
Marvel Studios' Moon Knight, the complete first season. Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi, the complete series. We're going to talk about that in a second. And Star Wars Andor, the complete first season. I, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first heard about this, besides being happy for my friends like Rob, who really still enjoy physical media and like to collect it. I do. Um, I thought, my first thought was, this is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, like I've understood why Disney has been trying to phase out physical media because they really want a big emphasis on Disney+. Plus. They want it to be so, hey, if you want to watch this content we have, you got to get Disney+. Plus. And they did not want to offer alternatives, you know, things that, hey, you want to watch Obi-Wan but not subscribe to Disney+. Plus. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I don't know if this is a sign that of the final death throngs of Disney being involved in physical media. I don't know if this is, they, they want to test this to see if it hypes up and attracts people to Disney plus, like if they think we'll put some things out in physical media and maybe that'll convince some people to go to Disney plus who haven't gone on Disney plus yet. Uh, either way, it's kind of interesting. The second thing that I thought was really interesting on this, and these are really two different conversations, but I'm fascinated by the designations of complete first season and complete series. Because they say about Marvel St Studios' Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they say the complete first season. That implies there's going to be other seasons, mm -hmm. which is interesting because they just moved Captain America to the big screen. Moon Knight, the complete first season. Uh, there's a lot of doubt out there that they're going to do a second one, but they're not calling it. But then Star Wars Obi-Wan. They didn't call that the first season. They call it the complete series. That's it. It's done. Yeah. I mean, that's basically <laughs> Lucasfilm saying no more of this, no more for you. And then, of course, Andor, the complete first season. We know a second season of that is coming. So I found that pretty interesting as well, both for Obi-Wan and for Falcon the Winter Soldier. Anyway, Rob, we in the midst of every announcement that's been coming up about Disney and physical media in the last couple of years has been getting out of physical media, getting out of physical media. And this kind of comes out of nowhere. Actually, hot on the heels of the their partnership announcement with Sony to release their physical stuff. What do you make of this, number one, as a physical media collector yourself, and then number two, kind of a separate topic, but the designations of first season versus complete series. Anyway, how do you see all this? Well, you know, for me, it, it's sort of sad because this is just an easy thing that they kind of have laying around. Like, okay, we've got these things. We can put them out. We can make them collectible in these nice steel books so the people that want them can buy them. And we have to put out a minimal amount of effort to do this because they already have this material. Um, so, I, you know, from a collectible standpoint, Marvel and Star Wars always will sell. There's always people that will buy them. So that's good. Um, what is disappointing to me about this is Disney celebrated its 100th anniversary last year and still there's no 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Mary Poppins in 4K. You know, that mm. in Dolby Vision, two of Walt's greatest live action achievements, they own the entire Fox library. And other than the Cameron titles, they've only transferred one movie in five years. I, I don't understand this. I mean, I get why they're doing this. And look, I'll buy Andor. I I've already pre-ordered it. I want it. You know, I thought uh, I loved Andor. I think it's great. Um, I'll probably buy Moon Knight just because I'm a Moon Knight fanatic and it, it'll look good. I'll put it on my shelf if I never watch it. It's a good looking package. Yeah, it's, it's a great, the packaging's amazing. Yeah, it's really good and, packaging. And I just wish that they would do more with their library. It's disappointing that this is a physical media release that we can just see on Disney+. Plus. It's so weird. Like you said, it's kind of counterintuitive in the sense that, well, why are they releasing things on physical media? The very reason you're supposed to subscribe to Disney Plus is to watch these exclusively there. Yeah. And so now I'm like, okay, here's one more reason why I don't need to keep Disney Plus, you know. But in terms of what they're calling, I think maybe there's a certain designation. I would imagine that the Obi-Wan series is something that was finished. The story was it began and it ended. Whereas the other shows, um, and or we know we're getting a season two. Yep. And so I think that, uh, and, and Falcon, the Winter Soldier, I think they're putting that out because they've got the movie coming out as well. So there's probably a tie-in there. They probably already had this scheduled to come out. I don't necessarily think they're going to make a season two. another season. I don't think this is indicative of that. But they know they're not going to do another season of Obi-Wan, I would imagine. That's why they call it what they call it. Whereas right. they've left it open-ended because they really don't know yet mm. about these other shows. That's what I would assume. All right, guys, 
question is for you. Are you a Disney Plus subscriber? If so, is there any temptation to buy the physical media? Maybe you're a physical media collector and you think it's confusing that this these are the titles they're offering when there's, like Rob was pointing out, there's so many other titles in the Disney library that you've been waiting to come out. Do you think this is a symbol that Disney's about to get more serious about physical media? Or are these the last fading breaths of a dying deer after a hunt? I don't know. Whatever you guys think, <laughs> jump down to the comment section below oh, and let us know. <laughs> I just made up that thing on the spot. I don't know where I was going with it. Let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's stick on the theme of Disney here for a second, shall we? And talk about this. You know... A lot of stories that we've been covering in the past year or two has been, unfortunately, a, a new kind of norm in the Hollywood industry of studios canceling projects, sometimes late in the development process, sometimes after they've started shooting, and even sometimes after they're finished, which is never really been heard of before i mean there have been completed movies that then went to a shelf and never got released but i mean like a thing like a bat girl which i mean i think especially after watching madam webb pretty thankful bat girl never got released <laughs> uh madam webb itself should never should have been released but the scooby-doo not scooby-doo well scooby-doo was coyote versus well. acme uh coyote versus acme um that not only did the studio shelf but when then we put it up for sale nobody else wanted it I mean, it's it's kind of a weird thing. Now, Disney has been in an interesting position where over the past couple of years under different leadership, they have gone really crazy with how much product they've been producing. And Bob Iger, after he came back as CEO, said, we need to cut back how much stuff we make. We're, we're just kind of wearing things out. We're diluting our product. Well, he believes in that so much that apparently he's just confirmed that they have quietly, secretly, been canceling projects that have been at various stages of development already. We don't know which ones those are, but this comes to us from the Hollywood Reporter. I write the following is Bob Iger said this, you have to kill things you no longer believe in. And that's not easy in this business because either you've gotten started or you have some sunk costs or it's a relationship with either your employees or with the creative community. Iger said, it's not an easy thing but you got to make those tough calls. We've actually made those tough calls. We've not been that public about it, but we've killed a few projects already that we just didn't feel were strong enough. All right, let me start with the last thing he said there. You know the old saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link? I, I think there's some wisdom in saying, look, we can't just put out product for the sake of putting out product. Because when you put out bad product, people remember it and, and it sticks with them. And we saw that like with the DCEU, with this gradual decline as people just started giving up on the whole thing. And even when they did put out something that was pretty good, in my opinion, Flash, people didn't want to go because it's too late. Like you lost us. Like you did all this bad stuff. The whole principle of saying, listen, we can't ship something out the door. It's, it's the same in physical products, right? Like I remember um, Steve Jobs would talk about, hey, we, we would spend millions of dollars and years on developing a new product. But at the end of the day, when we realized it just wasn't as good as it should be, the public never saw it. And, and we would quietly kill it because we can't just put out something that isn't good enough. Now, listen, there are always going to be times that studios think their product is good enough. And we as the audience don't agree. That's fair. That's totally fair. But when you as a studio know that you're making a product that is not good enough. Do you just do what we've seen a lot of the last couple of years? Put it out anyway. Put out Morbius. Put out Madam Web. Just, just throw them out there. What could go wrong? Apparently a lot. Or do you make what Iger and some other studios have called make a hard decision saying, look, we know we're going to have to eat a loss on this. We know whatever. But... For the overall long term, because you can't look short term, you always got to be a big picture person. It's better for us in the long run if we just don't release this or we don't complete this or we don't go into production on this or in some cases just scrap the one we've already finished. I know it's been very unpopular with people and people get all mad when I say, listen, there's wisdom to it. They don't want to hear that and I get it. That's fine, but it doesn't stop it from being true. 
Um, and it's kind of interesting hearing the way Bob Iger phrases that saying, listen, this sucks because as a company, we're a business. We don't want to lose money. We don't want to sink money into something and then not get a return on it. Of course we don't. Just like Apple doesn't want to make something and then not release it to the public or, you know, Ford maybe spend millions on a test concept car and then it never goes to market. Nobody wants to do that, but sometimes you got to make the hard decision. And I now Rob and Ray and Jonathan, what I am really curious about now is which projects are we talking about? Yeah, because no. they don't mention that. No, he, he said we've been quietly, yeah. not publicly killing some things at various stages uh, a, a couple i'm gonna I guess maybe one or two of those some star wars projects that we've heard about whether it's the taika watiti thing the kevin feige thing whether it's like whatever else ryan johnson's trilogy i mean look like, like that one was never alive i don't care what anybody says <laughs> man that 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 joke is old school man <laughs> <laughs> yeah that goes back now was it is it blade is it oh no oh, Ray. you would you would say I, no I'm, I'm just saying or is it like is it a, a significant i'm sure there's a pixar project or two in there so it also leaves me really really curious which projects are we talking about bob anyway rob you this has been a thing going on in the business now for a little while it's it's a general topic we've had to cover a couple of times not so specifically the way Iger just put it what do you think of uh, Iger's comments well look they have to do something uh they've got to you know their their share price is eking back up they need to make sure that the business is sound i mean hollywood's a mess right now and i think that these are the tough decisions that people have to make in bob Iger's position and i think he's being responsible to his shareholders and to the art itself i mean do we need to see another quantum mania you know do we need to see a film that's disappointing do we need to see a marvels i think releasing i mean what's interesting is both at warner brothers and at disney marvels significantly damages the marvel brand when a movie like Marvel's comes out and barely what makes $200 million when you're used to an average of a billion dollars for those movies and you're, you're losing your own audience base. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand where they're coming from, but, and these decisions should have been made before the film was greenlit. And I, I see this as responsible studio heading. Is that what you call it? Being a studio head, he's doing the responsible thing. We might not like it, it might not be something like, I want to see Mahershala Ali play Blade. It would bum me out if we're not going to get that Blade movie. But are we going to get that Blade movie? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, how long have they been teasing it? They've been teasing his voices in the end of The Eternals. And it's it's like, how hard can it be to make a vampire movie? <laughs> Apparently well, a lot. We've seen a lot of bad vampire movies. Yeah, but that's TV what I mean. They, I mean, it's come on. Easy. By the way, I like the Marvels. I didn't. I didn't love the Marvels, but I, I mean, it's a sitcom. It's. It. I mean, look. The problem is they've sat down. They looked at this glut of Disney Plus content they put out. That, with a couple of exceptions, like Ms. Marvel, WandaVision, have all been okay at best, terrible at worst. Looking at you, Secret Invasion. I was so excited. Oh yeah, and now. I mean, the good news, could, if you're Marvel right it. now, if you're Marvel right now, the good news is the next thing you've got up is Deadpool. Yeah, That's, Fox project. Yeah, well, it's not. Oh, I, not really. I know, it's, I know they bought it, but it's, I mean. Well, it's, no, they developed it. It's, it's not like it was a Fox project in development before. No, Disney it's took true, it over. but I mean, it's, it's still. A, it's, it's a pure Disney thing. It's still the, you know, you're using two characters that are unproven at your own studio. At your own studio, yeah. But mm -hmm. listen, I, I'm still thrilled that you know we go back to the first trailer that came out and the big question a lot of people had about because bob iger's gone back on a couple of things he's always said like he said we're not going to do we are a family thing we're not going to do r-rated stuff uh, kevin feige himself said we'll do deadpool r nothing else but it sounds like blade might be r now but i know a lot of people's only apprehension about deadpool was like well disney's not going to really let it be deadpool and the first thing they do in a Super Bowl trailer, they make a joke about pegging. <laughs> they make a joke about calling him Marvel Jesus. I mean, they're clearly going to go full. Oh, full yeah, full bore. And, and by the it. way, they I mean, come it. on. Who's not excited? I mean, especially after seeing that trailer, the movie looks hilarious. I hope it's the best thing in the world. I really do. I want it to be great. They need it to be great. It has I mean, to be great. It, this has to be something that really, you know, it's, 
I'm not going to say it's as dire as the DC situation as we talk about how, you know, Superman legacy now known just as Superman, that it's got to be great. Like they have to make that great, not to the same level, but I would propose that Marvel is kind of in the same situation where they really need Deadpool to rejuvenate excitement yeah. around the MCU. And well, if anything and, can do it, it's this one. And, I, and Iger actually, uh, more in that in that article, you know, he says something we echo around here a lot, where he says he pushed back on the idea of superhero or franchise fatigue, um, saying a lot of people think it's audience fatigue. It's not audience fatigue. They want great films. And if you build it great, they will come. There are countless examples of that. So, I mean, he's and he a, said he, right there in that comment there, bring oh, that back up for a yeah. second. He says it's not, a, Iger said this, and this is what I've been saying all the time. He says it's not an accident that Marvel's first 33 films generated just under $30 billion in the box office. Yeah. You would think if it was just fatigue, it would have set in after 10. Yeah, of course. Or 11. It's not comic book movie fatigue. It is mediocrity fatigue. And I think Bob Iger recognizes that. And he said, okay, then we need to start getting rid of the mediocre. And we got to focus more on quality. And every idea that we start in production, obviously we think has the potential to be really good. But if at some point we realize it's not, like Captain America 4, either let Kevin Feige go and do extensive reshoots or kill it. To make sure that every time... It used to be, Rob, I lament this a lot. It used to be that when we went to a new Marvel movie in theaters, it was just assumed. It was a given <laughs> that it was going to be awesome, right? And we were all excited. For like eight, nine, ten years, it was just a given that it was going to be awesome and therefore we could get excited and whatever. And now we've gone through a couple of years of, you know, pull out a coin. Oh, no, this one's not good. I mean, at, at <laughs> best, it's been a coin toss the last couple of years between the influx of the mediocre quality of stuff they put out on Disney Plus with stuff like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, some not so strong stuff. I mean, they got to get this fixed. And uh, Slim Shady said it. Trust Ryan Reynolds. Always. When you're in trouble, lean on a Canadian. They'll make it work. Anyway, guys, <laughs> question is for you. What do you think about Bob Iger's comments? I, I mean, some would say, yeah, they're great, but maybe they're a little overdue. Is it too late? Is it just in time? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's get over to this here, shall we? You know, we were just kind of mentioning that uh, DC's got a brand new era starting, right? Right. The DCU is dead. Long live the DCU. <laughs> As Aquaman 2 finished out the run of the DCU, at least becoming the first DCU film in eight movies in five years that actually crossed the $400 million mark. Well done, Aquaman yeah. 2. Yeah. Well done. So it's time for a new era. They got to get things started. They got to start from scratch, whatever. So they got, they're got they starting off with their best lead foot, Superman. Now we got Comic-Con coming up. And James Gunn is a big fan of Comic-Con. He loves Comic-Con. So a lot of people have kind of been assuming that James Gunn would go to Comic-Con to maybe not make new announcements, but just to highlight and talk about the projects they've got going, generate some excitement. Well, we assumed wrong because James Gunn just confirmed on his social media on threads he ain't going to be there. Uh, this comes to us from the folks at the San Diego Comic-Con blog who wrote, for anyone hoping for their first look at Warner Brothers' new universe under the helm of James Gunn and Peter Safran at San Diego Comic-Con this summer, if it happens, it looks like James Gunn at least won't be in attendance. <laughs> the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Suicide Squad director confirmed on threads that he won't be at Comic-Con this year as he'll be busy filming the upcoming Superman film. That's right. As far as excuses go for missing the convention, it's a good one. Uh, and so the, the post in particular comes from uh, somebody on threads asking him straight up, James, are you excited about Comic-Con? And just very short, James said, I'm not gonna be there, I'm gonna be shooting, I'm gonna be filming. Which is a bummer. I mean, it, it, it is a bummer. Now, it's important to note, he did not say DC won't have a presence there. Yeah. He didn't say my partner, Peter Safran, won't be there. <laughs> he didn't say that. I mean, maybe it means DC doesn't have a presence there this year, which would suck. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't like count out the fact that if they do do a presentation, they might be like, Hey, and lie and, and James Gunn from the set of uh, Superman and Maybe they have like a video has a quick little message yeah. about blah, blah, blah. Now yeah. here's the thing. I, I saw a discussion this morning 
It was somebody saying, um, you know, you know, well, can't you? It's it's like a day. Can't you just take like a day? And, and that's that's a fair question to ask, right? Except when you put in, keep in mind here that let's assume this movie's going to be, it's not going to be super expensive. Let's say it's going to be a $200 million movie. And they got a 120 day shooting schedule. That means every day is costing you two, almost $2 million a day. And is that worth it? Probably not. Especially and especially when you got people in their flow and working and all that kind of stuff and your crew's all there, your set's there, James Gunn's in a flow, and you're you're in the midst of making your movie. Now we have seen filmmakers step away from their sets to go to Comic Con, but they've never been making a movie as important in this one as this one and and how how big it is. Uh, I'm one of the, probably on the side of this is great news. He's concentrating on what's yeah. important. What's yeah. important. It, giving us a first good movie. You have tons of comic cons after this one to appear, and when you're get, when when you have your ball rolling already. Yeah, yeah like San Diego's not you, the only game in town. Sometimes you count your your chicken, you know, before they hatch. You, you don't want to do that. You want to focus on the task at hand, and that, that's what that, I I love hearing this. To be honest, yeah. I mean, sometimes Comic Con needs to just go back to comics. You know, you know, selling comic books maybe one year. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that's when nobody went. Yeah, but that's when it's there's not a lot of people there. Well, I mean, but but at the same time, I mean, th this goes to a kind of a bigger discussion too, right? Like at the same time, the reality is, on an average year, hundred twenty thousand people go to Comic Con, right? Flood into San Diego. You know how many people fit in Hall H? Six thousand. Six. Out of 120,000 people there, essentially, nobody that goes to Comic Con would actually be in Hall H for a James Gunn presentation we, anyway. I don't know how many years we covered it with AMC and Collider. I've yet to actually set foot in Hall H, and I've been there working. The uh, the only time in the past seven years that I went into Hall H was when I was a moderator, when I was like hosting one of the panels. That's it. I mean, it's just so, I don't know how big of an impact that'll actually have on it, but I was just kind of looking forward to whatever the presentation was going to be. Sure. And even hearing about it afterwards, even if I wasn't going to be in the hall. But I echo what Ray said. I mean, look, this movie is the most important thing DC has done in ages, because if you botch this Superman movie, you're, I think you're screwed for the next five years. Absolutely. Keep your focus where it needs to be. But Rob, I mean, hopes is still... He's still there. He didn't specifically say DC won't have a presence. He didn't say Peter Safran won't be there. What do you think about James Gunn's comments? And with those comments, what do you think the chances are that we still get some form of a DC presentation at Comic-Con? Well, as you know, I worked on Superman Returns. Yes. I was there the entire... For San Diego, we flew, private, flew to from Australia to San Diego to present for the very first time HD in Hall H. It was the first time HD was presented there. I actually made a video along with Adam Robitel and Todd Stanley on this whole journey that you can watch. I think it's on YouTube. It's one of Brian's journals. I think it's called 24 Hours in San Diego, where they had to stop in Hawaii, you know, and we busted our asses to get this footage to show. And and whatever you think of the movie, that trailer went over like gangbusters in all H. So it can be done. It doesn't matter how deep into filming you are, it can be done. And we started shooting in March, kind of the same way they did. So same amount of time. That said, John. They know they could show you the greatest piece of footage in the world that would excite everybody. Half the internet's going to hate it. There's no benefit for them to show anything from this movie until it is absolutely ready. I think, like you've pointed out, there's way too much writing on this. And I think it's a conscious decision. They've already got, I mean, you, you make a comment. Look at how an AI-generated photo suddenly yeah, makes people go that's bananas. That's right, we talked about that the other day. Yeah, there's nothing to be gained by them going to Comic-Con now. Nothing. They're way too early in the process. This is not just another superhero movie. This is the beginning, the dawn of, as you put it, a 10-year plan. A dawn the of justice, maybe? <laughs> Whoa! Don't. I, I just <laughs> Sorry, think, I, I, I regret that. I regret I that. I just <laughs> think that there's nothing to be gained. And when we do see what they're going to show us, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be exactly the right thing. And everyone's going to be like, even the most staunch internet trolls are going to be like, that's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly believe that because I, I have utter faith in James Gunn and Peter Safran. The cast 
everything they've got. I want to hear Wendell Pierce say something in whatever trailer they give us. Hmm. Kent, get in here. Whatever he says, <laughs> you know, it's it's going to be. Uh, I can't wait for it. But there's no reason to go to Comic Con now, not See? with the amount. Of, of what's riding on this movie. I agree with you, and I would feel differently if, say, Superman was five months away. Yeah. Right? Then there's actual tangible benefit from for starting the, yes. the, the whole momentum building. But the movie's still a year away. And now, and I, I can already hear some people saying, well, wait a minute. James Gunn had just started shooting Guardians of the Galaxy, and they stopped production. They went to Comic-Con showed that just like the little footage that they shot in the first week there. Yeah, but that was in the midst of a massive Marvel presence, in the midst of a massive upswing with the Marvel Cinematic Universe that was already completely healthy and making billions, and it was a small group of characters. The importance of this movie is so huge. I yeah. just don't know you can get away no from it. No one knew the Guardian, so they, they had to hype it up. I yeah, mean, you most had to people at least introduce know. people to the concept of something yeah. to be aware of. What's crazy to think about is this might be one of the first Comic Cons where we don't see plastered on the wall any Marvel projects, any DC projects, because Marvel only got, what, Deadpool this year? They got Deadpool. So it's kind well, of and, like... And we, they got to... Uh, um, Agatha coming at some point. Oh, yeah. Agatha's going to be coming along. Right. It's kind uh, of like yeah. there's, there's, <laughs> there's kind of like a, a way for these smaller movies maybe to shine this year at Comic-Con, you know, to take the spotlight. It would be interesting to see what people are talking about after the weekend is done. Maybe Creature Commandos. I don't know when that debuts, but they yeah, might promote I mean, that. The, and, and you don't need James there for that. James nope. not yeah. even the director of that. So, I mean... Bring bring need... the cast, bring the director, do, you know, do whatever you want to do there. Though, I mean, I, I but think But do you think, we'll, do you think DC will announce that, hey, Peter's going to go and, and we'll still have a DC presence? Or do you think DC's just going to be absent? And you totally? know what? I think it's important for the brand. I, I agree. I was thinking the same thing. You know, I mean, yeah. there's... I do. I think it's, it's Comic-Con, as Brian said, this is Superman and this is Comic-Con. That's well, why he said he wanted to go. But in this case you know superman is a thing unto itself but they've still got a ton of other stuff happening yeah so why not promote their slate or whatever that give us a like an updated five-year plan yeah no, yeah and know. also if they announce a new actor for batman bring him out yeah, trot him that, out that could be a time to do it you know i mean trot him out and 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 here's here's we're going to announce the cast of brave and the bold here you go you know what i shouldn't do this no no, no don't oh boy oh, what is it bro because this isn't something that's in a movie, but you'll see this in the trades in the next couple of days. But I, I have found out for sure, Alan Richson is the new Batman. No, I'm kidding. I, I just, no, j I'm just joking. I'm joking. Dude, Dude, that, my that, be real, man. And put out on the. <laughs> that's gonna be John Campion says Alan Richson is the new Batman. No, nope. yeah. it's already on uh, the internet. And John maybe it will. Uh, but Alan listen, Richard. if they, by the way, if they do announce that he's it. Total coincidence that I just made that joke. Sure. Just, just sure. Well, no one's Way to let, cover your ass there, buddy. Just, just let <laughs> sure. you know. I'm so Total down joke. for Rich, Richson as a... Uh, I, I think you, he'd be a great Batman. Did you see the video he put up? He was cleaning the back of his car, and he was talking about how his son projectile vomited all over the back of their Escalade. <laughs> I did not see this. It was no. such a sweet video, and he's like, he's like, here's the important thing, and he was saying, you have to understand... Like and he say the point that he was making as he's cleaning, he's using simple green. But his his point was, he wanted his kids to know that it really doesn't matter that you blew chunks all over the back of this Escalade. What matters is that we're family. This can be cleaned up. You don't have to feel embarrassed or whatever. And these things will go away. It doesn't matter that something like this happened. I'm not going to get mad at my kid because he blew chunks in the back of my bed. I mean, wait till car. he's 22 and, and <laughs> blow chunks of alcohol. Well, anyway. <laughs> it, 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 I, family, I, Dad. I, I, I love the video he made. It was on, I saw it on Instagram. <laughs> I'm like, if you wanted, if you want to make me love that guy more than I already do, that was the way to do it. It was a very sweet video, and um, I was like, he, I wish he was my dad. Can, can I just? I, mean, I had a great dad. I don't have a dad. Well, listen, we've gone away, way but... off. Uh, we've gone way yeah, off. Uh, you brought him up. Man, I'm just telling it's of, true. I'm the one who brought up Alan Richardson. But speaking of Alan Richardson and Batman, I actually, this is someone I prefer, and I'm being, I would actually like him to play Hush. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That'd be good. But 100%. that's further down the line. As, as you know. What's that? That would. Yeah. That would. Yeah. Or you could lead off with that. I mean, who knows what James Gunn's going to do in that wild imagination of his? But one yeah. thing we know for sure: that wild imagination won't be at Comic Con. Guys, question is for you. 
What do you think? Is this the right, responsible decision that James Gunn is making to say, look, we're in the throes of it. And probably by that point, they're going to be in the home stretch of, of wrapping up filming to stay focused, keep everything on target. Or do you think it's, and remember, this movie is still like a year away, more than a year away. So what do you think? Right move, wrong move, whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, with that down, it's time to get on to the most important part of the show, which is you guys. What do you guys want to discuss and talk about here? What questions, observations do you have? But before we get to those, we're going to take a quick second and thank a sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Factor. We want to take a second and thank a sponsor of today's video, Factor. You know, guys, some days it's great to prepare your own meal, but some days it's great to have wonderful, delicious meals already ready to go. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals makes eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. They've got snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And guys, you get to save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So guys, head to factormeals.com slash camp Campia50 and use the code Campia50 to get 50% off. That's code Campia50 at factormeals.com slash Campia50 to get 50% off. And thank you to our friends at Factor for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's get over to your stuff here, shall we? Jonathan, what we got up first? Okay, first up, we've got uh, Christopher Brickner, who says, uh, let me move this over a little bit. Uh, Disney quietly canceling movies. I wonder how many uh, were Star Wars films. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, ap ap 100%, at least one of them was. The ones that he says we've quietly just pulled the plug on, 100%. Because how many Star Wars films have we heard are coming? There's like, like without exaggeration, no hyperbole, at least eight like if you want to count the Taika Waititi one, the Kevin Feige, like all that kind of stuff, I yeah, I uh, um, hundred percent at least one of them is a Star. I wish project. Bob Iger could use the world between worlds and go back and cancel Rise of Skywalker. I'd feel good about that. Yeah, it's just do it so differently. I mean, we needed a third one; just needed to be completely different, completely different. All right, what's next? Uh, Jay Loco says Netflix Avatar episode one can't. I keep pretending I'm your friend. You are my friend, Man of Steel. Wow, really? Netflix, y'all took this from my people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I, I know somebody else brought that up to me. It's it's no look. That's hundred percent. When Ang says to his uh, air tribe master, "Can't we just keep pretending I'm your friend? I am your friend." It's like, yeah, that wasn't directly ripped off from Man of Steel. <laughs> I mean, obviously it was. It worked. I mean, it worked in the scene, but it was a total, total ripoff of Man Homage, Steel. John. Oh, yeah. Homage. That's right. It was an homage. All right. What's next? Uh, we got Bobby Jackson who says, um, do you, I don't know what happened to my sizing. I'll fix it in a minute. Do you, uh, do you think Disney she will said. be watching? <laughs> I don't have that one ready yet. <laughs> uh, do you think Disney will be watching the box office of Bad Boys 4 to gauge reception of Will Smith being back? And uh, if they could move forward with an Aladdin 2? Look, it's it's not Disney. I think the entire Hollywood industry is going to be looking very closely at Bad Boys Four and and whether or not the general audience is ready to welcome Will Smith back. Look, we we talked about this the other day, Rob. Um, I I said this on the show yesterday. I think I, as much as anybody, was really disappointed in Will Smith with what happened at the Oscars, and I thought. Not everybody did, but I definitely thought there needed to be repercussions and consequences for what he did. You can't, you can't do what he did. That was really one of the most ass stupid things. And I was very disappointed because I'm a fan of Will Smith, all that kind of stuff. But at some point, you have to say the price has been paid, right? And and my whole point of this has been, okay, he went up, assaulted a guy, slapped him. As a result. 
he has lost out. Like, if you went up to somebody in public and slapped them, you would not suffer the same consequences Will Smith did. Will Smith literally lost out on tens of millions of dollars of contracts, projects, uh, representation, all that kind of stuff. He's He literally lost out tens, he lost tens of millions of dollars. Well, and he lucked out that Chris Rock didn't press charges. Well, because yeah, and the Chris police Rock, were there, and they're like, we'll arrest him right now if you press charges. And Chris Rock was yeah, like, I don't Chris know. Chris Rock didn't press charges. He was globally humiliated. And, and rightfully so. He brought it on himself. But he was lost out on tens of millions of dollars, globally humiliated, had now everybody dredging up his whole marriage for the world to talk oh, about God. that oh, also man. furthered his humiliation. Thereof. Yeah, which also <laughs> furthered his public humiliation. It, and it's been years. At some point, and so I'm just, I can only speak for myself. Was I super disappointed in Will Smith's actions? Yes. But am I ready for him to now come back? Yeah. I, I think the price has been paid. I think it's at some point somebody goes to the penalty box and then you got to say, okay, you served your time in the, in the penalty box. You can now come back on the ice. A hockey analogy for those of you out there. You can come back on the ice now. So I think, yes, Rob, I think Disney is going to be watching. I think it might be too late for an Aladdin 2, but I think Disney will be, but I think the whole industry is going to be watching to see is the audience ready to get back into the Will Smith business and can we then get back into the Will Smith business? I don't know, Rob, what do you think? I'm with you, dude. I love Will Smith. I've always loved Free Willy, or <laughs> Big P, P Willy, Big Willy style. <laughs> That's not what he is. No, um, I've always loved him. And, and look, from Enemy of the State to, to, you know, playing Serena's dad, I think that Will Smith is an incredible actor. He's a great presence. He's a great movie star, you know, and I, I think... I can't imagine what it's like to have been him after this happened. You know, obviously he wasn't thinking about it. He was. The, the and it moment, was his own fault. It, it was absolutely his own fault. His own fault. Yep. He's going to have to look. Dave Chappelle recently was taken, relived that whole thing on his latest comedy special. It was pretty hilarious. And I'm like, it. no one's ever going to forget it. And he's got to live with that, that mark every day of his life for the rest of his life. I think we're better off with Will Smith movies I than agree. without them. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think he's a better presence in the world. And you know what? Here's a guy that will always stand as a representation of what can happen. It doesn't matter how successful you are, how popular you are. No one is beyond losing control in a moment and being humiliated on stage. So he's he's a cautionary tale, and I would like to see him come back and 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 do great work because I think that we are better off as a culture with Will Smith movies. Now, here's a question. Will audiences come back? And watch Bad Boys for probably reduced. I think they will. Uh, yeah, I, I you know what? They will. At the end of the day, do people want to sit there and hold him uh, accountable, or do they want to watch a good Bad Boys movie? I see, think they want to see a good would, Bad Boys movie. My argument would be he has been held accountable. Totally. And, Humili and I mean, my God, humiliated over and over, still to this day. Yeah. And by the way, his image will never be the same again, right? The Fresh Prince, gosh, Uncle Phil, like Happy Go Lucky, Will Smith you know summer 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 time like that parents that, just don't understand yeah that that image has been forever tarnished and he's always going to have to live with that but i i think i, I think audiences will come back for bad but i think it's been long enough the box hitch office two, john <laughs> hitch two the box office will ring true on this so it made four yeah. three made 426 worldwide let's see what the box yeah. office see i don't is. know if it'll make over 400 million uh, like like the last one was I, but I still think it'll do well and I think that will kind of reopen the doors for him to come back more anyway we'll find out I love yeah. Hitch all right what's Great. next all right we got Sora fan who writes uh hey guys sick in bed but glad to be able to uh watch live wanted to know your thoughts on Avatar season two and three being announced by the way trench coats forever <laughs> trench coats forever um well, we already went over that. I, yeah. I mean, I not only am I glad that this particular story, but I'm glad to see Netflix actually greenlighting two seasons. Yeah. Because, look, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm sure it has. I can't recall Netflix ever greenlighting multiple seasons. Maybe Stranger Things. Even then, I, I think I think it was always they announced the next season got greenlit. Yeah. You might be right. Though. Or breaking it into two seasons. Yeah, or something you know, like so. that. All right. Well, what's I'm next? happy, though. Uh, we got uh, Bill's HQ who says Dune 2 adds to the first in such interesting ways. For example, in the first when uh, Stilgar meets House Atreides and spits as a sign of respect. 
thought it was weird at first, but it makes so much sense now. Yeah, I mean, like when you understand the absolute preciousness of water, that spitting is a huge, like there's a scene too where, so, I'm not gonna give the context for those who haven't seen the movie yet, but somebody starts crying and like Stilgar's like, no, 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 no. And like he literally takes his finger, wipes up the tear and swallows it because water is that precious. And so the way all that stuff connected, I thought was done very, very well. All right, what's next? Uh, Mr. Godzilla says, hey, John and crew, my birthday was a few days ago and I missed out on your open mic the day to send you guys, uh, that, oh, that day to send you guys uh, just some love. Thanks again for all you do. Oh, thank you so Aww. much for that, man. I always appreciate that when somebody just wants to write in to be supportive. So thank you, man. And happy belated birthday, happy my friend. I hope you have a great one. All right, what's next? Uh, Matan says, hey, uh, CinemaCon is... Oh, Got to move this down a little bit. A theory on what is the mystery film at CinemaCon is it's Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis, the only one that can challenge Dune for an Oscar. A reminder, it doesn't have a distributor yet. Then no, it won't be playing at CinemaCon. Yeah. Right. Remember, has, yeah. CinemaCon is about the movie theater owners. If there's no distributor yet... The movie theater owners aren't interested in them playing that. So, look, I would be very excited. Um, I, But I would also caution you on thinking in any sort of way that Francis Ford Coppola's upcoming movie is a legitimate Oscar contender for something. It's been a long time. I mean, yeah, Francis made the Godfather films, but what has he done of real impact significance since? It does worry me. Yeah, I mean, so again, I'm not. Come on, the rainmaker rules. I, look, I'm not saying he's lost it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, let's not pretend it's only four years ago that The Godfather Two came out, and like it's it's been a real long time. I'm very curious, but without a distributor, I don't think it'll be the one that plays there. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I, I find it highly unlikely it will play at CinemaCon without a distributor. I agree. Yeah, because CinemaCon's for. For exhibitors, for movies, yeah, without that, a distributor, for things that are no coming out, so they can get excited about them. Yeah, exactly. All right, what's next? We got Manuel who says, uh, "John said Dune makes me excited to go to the movies again, and I just can't wait to see what Cameron will bring with Avatar next." As yeah. John said a billion times uh, last winter, never bet against Cam. Never bet against Cameron. Like, how many times does he have to prove it? Like every time he makes something, it's just gangbusters. The dude literally holds three of the top four spots of the all-time highest grossing films ever in history. I mean, yeah, you never bet against him. And look, I I didn't know what to expect going into the second avatar. And I was really impressed. I mean, that that's a an experiential event, as all movies should be. And I'm telling you what, I am actually I am more excited for the next avatar film than I was for two to be honest with you. So, I, yeah, I'm pretty stoked for that, too. All right, what's next? Uh, we got Raymond Verrata who says, what Oscar categories are still up for grabs Sunday? There's one. I mean, if we're talking about the legitimate, if we're talking about the significant Oscars, the ones that the viewers actually care about, I'm not talking about best short animated, best short documentary, that 99% of the audience has never seen any of them. There's only one. Ann and I were just talking about this in the car last night there really is only one left like with with um i thought there was a shot that paul giamatti would win the sag but killian murphy won it i think that kind of settled i think killian murphy i i i, I think it's a long shot that anybody other than killian murphy wins clearly oppenheimer is going to win best picture clearly christopher nolan is going to get his first best director yeah. Academy. like all that stuff Divine's going to win Best Supporting Actress. Robert Downey Robert Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is going to win Best Supporting Actor. The only category. I mean, writing, adapted, uh, cinematography, all that stuff. It's it's all written in stone. Best Lead Actress. That's it. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the a only one that's race. the big question mark right now. Because it looked like Emma Stone had mm -hmm. all the momentum, and then SAG happened. And now... It's a coin toss, and that's the only one that's going to have any kind of tension around it. Like, who's going to win that? I mean, look, that Rob, there's still a possibility for some big surprises, right? The fact that we think all the other categories are such locks opens up the potential yes. for huge surprises. But honestly, I think the only one going into that I'm even wondering about is the best lead actress category. Are there any others? You know what? I don't think it's going to win. But I think Godzilla minus one has a shot 
at the effects Oscar. I know everyone's saying creator's going to take it, but I think, I think that I think it might win. I can't believe, you know, I'll tell you why I can't believe it will. And, and it shouldn't. I'll tell you why yes, it shouldn't. It yes, should. The visual effects in Godzilla minus one are mind blowing for the budget. But it's still clear to me that there was a limited budget. And the award isn't best visual effects bang for your buck per dollar. It's best overall. And I simply don't think Godzilla minus one competes overall. I mean, for the budget, it's insane what they did. But, but I think it's also for the film. You know, what effects suited the film. But they never give out best, best, best visual effects for the quality of the film. We've used them truly awful films. And they shouldn't. It's about just the visual effects. I'm just thinking, I really want it to win. I'm uh, not, well, that's another that's yeah, a that, different yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, you want to see bias. the video they made, the six-minute Toho video that they made about the, how they did the effects? I mean, you know what? How they do them. They did them well. You know what? They God did them minus, very did well. Them well. You know what? Minus one will win. My pre-order for that Blu-ray. There you That's, go. There you yeah. go. That Blu-ray, boy. But I, but I admit, like we were when we were sitting in the theater watching, it's like, okay, the fact that this what was it like a ten million dollar budget? Like twelve. Okay, twelve fifty. Okay, whatever. That's super low. That's crazy low. I remember sitting in there the whole time going, I can't believe this is made for like ten fifteen million dollars. I can't believe it. But there were also many times in the film when it's like. Okay, you can clearly see this was a ten to fifteen million dollar movie here at, give, or here or no, whatever. yeah, give it up. That was the best atomic blast ever in a Godzilla film, right? Can we at least sure? give that? Can we yeah, give it that? I'll, okay, if you want to narrow it down, to that that, that thing. narrow and focus. I mean, fifteen million went all into that blast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fourteen to the fifteen. So million better than the blasted up and Even that though was a I scene. still think it's a it's a shoe in for Robert Downey Jr., I think. That American fiction could take it on Best Supporting Actor for uh, With, uh, Sterling, Sterling Brown. Uh, Sterling, but, yeah, Sterling Brown. Sterling K. Brown? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, listen, I would love, if I was a voting Academy member for the Best Lead Actor, we've been talking, it's Paul Giamatti and it's Killian Murphy. But I'll tell you what, I would probably vote for one of those two, but I'd be very tempted to vote for Jeffrey Wright. He was so good in that. Like, it, like mind-boggling good, but so were Paul and Killian, so... But yeah, the only one I got is best lead actress. That's the only one that's got some mystery to it. But again, it does open up the possibilities for, for some really big surprises. Best picture of the year, Madam Web. Da, da, da. But <laughs> it wasn't even nominated. Is Christopher Nolan the only first D that we're going to get in this Oscars? Or Lily Gladstone if she wins? She's well, Lily Gladstone, She's yeah. a first D too, right? Yeah, she would, she would be a first D. Uh, but right. yeah, so Robert Downey Jr. would be a first. No, no, he's only been nominated. He's never won. Oh, he would be a first D too. He would be a first. Yep, he would be a first okay. D. All right, what's next? All right, Raymond is back and says, "Congrats to Hoyt Van Hoytema Oppenheimer at ASC." Oh, the, uh, Hoyte, he's the cinematographer. Cinematographer Oppenheimer. won that. Yeah, and will probably win at the Academy Awards. Yes, you know? I think that one's kind of written in stone. All right, what's next? Chris uh, Chris Martin says. Hi, John. Have you used uh, Raycon earbuds? If so, how are they? Yeah, you know what? In all seriousness, they were a sponsor of mine four years ago. Yeah. Well, and even less because I was running those ads too. Yeah. yeah. Bang for your buck. Because they're like half the price of yeah, some other stuff. Bang prices. for your buck. They were, I mean, and just full disclosure, they're no longer a sponsor of mine. I can say yeah. whatever shit I want about them. But bang for your buck. I was very happy with those. I have a now, pair. Uh, do you have a pair? Yeah. yeah, I still have mine. Now, um, I have bought since then, like much more expensive ones. Like I like the Sony. I'm right now. I'm using the Sony earbuds plus pro plus, whatever that's called. But I'll tell you what they are. These headphones are a little bit better than the Raycons. They're not twice as good, but they are twice the price. I'm telling you, the Raycons are a pretty good value. Here's here's the problem with uh, getting the better one. Well, for me, I'm always scared to wear them. So so Raycons would be probably my go-to. If yeah, if I, you lose them, oh, yeah, well. Oh, it's like, yeah, I'll get another <laughs> it's not pair. a big of an investment. Outstanding name, Raycon. Outstanding name. Is guy. Yeah, I got to give it up for them. <laughs> All right, what's next? Alex says, seeing Dune again tomorrow on IMAX 70 millimeter. Nice. I feel grateful to be able to live in a time when I get to experience this. Only 12 IMAX 70 millimeters in the world for Dune 2. Long live the fighters. Long live cinema. Long live cinema. I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I, I'm i going to be talking for the next probably month about because it's 
I cannot remember the last time I felt of a movie. This is probably the best movie I've seen in the last 10 years. I don't know when the last time I've said that in my life is. And so it's huge. But I'll tell you something else, Rob. I was hit with this feeling yesterday about what a time right now this moment. Because we got Dune 2 in cinema. And I just watched the third episode of Shogun. Which is blowing my freaking mind right now. Hi, Toru Nagasama. I love this show perfect it's uh, right you, you, it's almost as if i was born <laughs> japanese it's like i'm from osaka this show yeah. is so good and just give yeah you know sonata a, an emmy right now cosmo is also great in it uh as john blackthorne uh, by the way, I love his voice. I do too. I love his voice. He's great. Well, he's got like a do you have no respect for the for the purity of women? That's his, his, <laughs> his voice is just great. I love the guy who's playing this, the uh, uh, Rodriguez. I just I am loving, 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 loving this show so much. Can I we, hope it doesn't go south. Can we go back to Dune real quick? Sure. I said it was a one and done for me, but as I'm adding this Paul Atreides to my cart for Anne's birthday, an action figure. <laughs> I actually am thinking about maybe I should see this again. I'm actually feeling I know Anne, like I want to see it. Without exaggerating, Anne wants to see it at least five more times in theater. <laughs> oh so my God. She would love it if you would go with it. Are you her. rocking the McFarlane figure? I yeah, will yeah. say, you I know, will. Yeah. Art's making Apollo Trades. I know, but this. 500 is, bucks, baby. It won't, it won't come. <laughs> Rooted this hair. is already uh, out. Yeah, they've already. Yeah, they've put so this out. the thing, though, like I know you hate, you hate long movies, but once you've already seen it, they go faster because you, know, yeah, what, you, know, you yeah. know where it's leading. Yeah. So. All right, what's next? Uh, Kevin's with a $50 super oh, chat. Uh, oh. Wow. Thank you so Thank much, you, Kevin, for supporting us on that level, man. It's incredibly generous of you, dude. He says, uh, hey, folks, I highly appreciate your advice yesterday since I was in the topic of Damian Wayne. Which actor do you think would crush it in the role? Thanks, guys, and bring on the damn I'm not movie. really – I'm not big on X actor and X role. That's – that's Robin, but, right? The, yeah, the Robin. that's that's the his son, Bruce's son version Damien. of Robin, the one that acts like a punk sometimes. Like, yeah, you know, like... I'll be honest with you. First of all, Damien is of an age that I can't name a lot of child, right. child yeah, actors that age who too. could do it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of Damien Wayne. I kind of am after Injustice. I'm, I'm like obviously <laughs> the greatest of all time is. Uh, Richard Grayson, like Dick Grayson, the he, right. I mean, that's, that's the true yeah. Robin. Then he became Nightwing, Nightwing become so. Batman. He's the true heir to the bat, right? Grayson is the true heir to the bat. But outside of that, I'm more of a Tim Drake guy than, uh, than I, I, I just find Damien a little irritating. And there's yeah, a Jason Todd, sometimes. right? What's that? There's Jay. Yes. So Jason I would Todd's say a douche. Tim Drake and Jason yeah, And that's Todd. why they killed him. Like they, literally the readers <laughs> voted. If you guys don't remember this. Back in the death in the family, the DC literally, because they heard all these complaints about Jason Todd, and they literally put it to a vote to the readers. Yep. Not thinking for a second that the readers would actually vote to kill him. <laughs> and the readers voted to kill him. Ruthless. So and is that why Death in the Family came around? Was it that yeah, long ago? They, yeah, it was, it was that's what brought the Joker beat beat him half to yeah. death with oh, a crowbar yeah. that blew oh him up. Yeah, that was so Bad, yeah. Only then to later bring him back as Red Hood, which turned into a pretty popular character arc and everything for a lot of people. But yep, that's why they killed Jason Todd. Oh my God! Never has a beatdown been so traumatizing to me, dude. I'm telling you what, the, I was pretty I young when I when I was younger. The first time yeah. reading that, and like literally, they never showed the crowbar hitting his head. Yeah, it was the, oh, the, the frame teeth. was just on Joker raising the crowbar oh. and smash, and just seeing blood splatter coming up and smashing him. Like it was one. At the time for me, that was like one of the most horrifically violent things I'd ever seen in a comic book. And Robin was dying. They yeah. killed Robin. It was so crazy. Good riddance. All right. <laughs> What's next? All right. Matt Boyle says, uh, just give uh, Hiroyuki Sonata the Emmy already. Oh, I, was, I just said that. <laughs> I just, yeah. He's, oh my God. He's, look, first of all, he's always been awesome. There, He's one of these actors where it doesn't matter even if you drop him in freaking Mortal Kombat. Oh, he Oh yeah, he's Scorpion, right? Yeah, he's Scorpion in it, right? Even if you drop him in Mortal Kombat, he brings a power and a his presence 
on screen. It's like the moment, he, even in John Wick, as soon as he steps into camera, you're like, this movie just hit a different level just because that guy's there. He's so good. And I love, like, th there's very rarely do I like to say there is a perfect casting because there always could have been maybe a hundred other people that could have been even better. But Sonata as Lord Tornaga is perfect. Like, it's absolutely perfect. It's hard to imagine somebody else playing that role. All right. Anyway, sorry, I'm geeking out here. What's next? CM Waters film enthusiast says Moon Knight physical release is labeled as complete for a season while Obi-Wan is labeled complete. Hint at Moon Knight season two. We kind of touched on that already, but I don't know that it hints that there will be a Moon Knight season two so much as it keeps the door open. I think it's more of a commentary on Obi-Wan is done, right? Like, I, I don't even suspect that we're going to get a Falcon and the Winter Soldier season two. But like Rob, you were saying, they're keeping that door open. And we're getting the movie. And, and we're getting Captain America 4. So I think really not so much a commentary that these other ones will get second seasons. I think it's more of a statement that this one ain't. I think that's what really more the story is. All right, what's next? Uh, we got um, Victor Ed Edbaum who says, Rob, I saw screenshots of the upcoming 4K release of True Lies. I don't know if they're legit, but it looks worse than T2. I can't believe Cameron approved this. I hope at least Aliens is good. What? Well, okay, so... Park Road Post, which is Peter Jackson's post-production facility, used AI for the transfers of these new Cameron movies. So there is a, and I haven't seen them, to be fair, because they don't come out till next week, uh, that these discs don't look what like they should when you're doing a true film transfer. And if this is the future, it's problematic, I think. And James Cameron looks to have monkeyed around with the look of The Abyss, Aliens, which is a grainy film to begin with, and True Lies. So I'll have to wait and see, but the reports are not great. And my all-time favorite action film, True Lies. Gotta I have a bootleg from Spain. What's that? But I have a bootleg Blu-ray from Spain of really? True Lies. I do. All yes. right. What's next? Okay, Mr. I says, uh, leaked Secret war scene uh, during a large end battle. Deadpool says, hey, Jen, did you know you can say the F word in these <laughs> PG-13 movies? She-Hulk, fuck, I didn't know that. Uh, Deadpool, no, that was mine. See Rogers' language. By the way, he sent in a $20 super NC chat. Thank 20, you so yeah. much for that, man, and supporting us on that level. I, you know, that, okay, that brings up a really interesting question. Are we going to see She-Hulk again in the MCU? Mm -hmm. Now, I... I think it's a foregone conclusion we're not going to get a She-Hulk season two. And I am all okay with that. But in the midst of the miserableness that was the experience of watching She-Hulk, the character itself worked for me. Yeah. I liked the character. I didn't and think I she was great. And I certainly liked Tatiana Mislani playing the character. I just hated their team of writers mm -hmm. who couldn't make anything funny. And nothing is worse than when something is so obviously trying to be funny and it ain't being funny. And that was She-Hulk. And so uh, the big question to me is, could we see the character again? I will go on record, Rob, and say, I certainly hope so. I would. I think yeah. she would fit in great with the MCU. I don't know, what do you think? I completely agree with you. I think we will definitely see her probably in an Avengers movie if they ever make an Avengers movie, if they ever decide who the Avengers are gonna actually be. But I think we <laughs> definitely see her come back. Um, yeah, I thought she was a great character. I loved her performance. I, I thought she Hulk looked great. I loved everything about it, except the damn show she was in, yeah, she <laughs> which to me, I mean, you know, it, it, it's almost like those writers were defying making the show good. Yeah. I mean, they had the John Byrne comic to look at, like, and you see them Well, we didn't look at any of the comic books. I'm like, well, you should have, cause the comic pretty much told you exactly what you want to do, but you, you forget the comics. You forget that for a second. The concept that they pitched when we, we heard that this was coming, that this is going to be an Ally McBeal procedural law comedy within the world of the MCU. Great. I love what you just said. So much promise. And, and the first episode kind of felt like they were scratching at that promise. Like, I liked the first episode. I did. I liked the first one. Like, if they had just, like were able to focus in and follow through on that promise, you could have had 
Like in, in a world where a lot of people were complaining, all the MCU is the same, even though everybody who said that is wrong. But a lot of people saying everything in the MCU is the same. It truly could have been a wonderfully unique, different kind of thing. And they even did that one thing where she was in the bar and they had Ally McBeal up on the TVs. Like, yes, that's what this is supposed to be. And they just filled a writer's room. And look, I, I feel bad saying shit like this because I don't know the individuals who are there. Maybe they're all very well-meaning and, and maybe really talented and just swung and missed on She-Hulk. But like, if you're going to write a comedy series, get people who fucking know how to write comedy. And it just they just missed it on so many levels. Also, the, the MCU, they had two things they could have done. They could have done the MCU's first out-and-out -out comedy, but they could have also used the show to actually make legitimate commentary and extend the MCU, the universe itself, in the context of this legal series. They could have delved into some really fun, interesting stuff that was great in-universe deliciousness, and they didn't even do that. Yeah. Okay, but none of that matters because... Uh, Gabe Kunda just gifted 50 John Campia me memberships. What? Wow. <laughs> hey, oh my hey. God, Gabe, 50 memberships? Thank you so much. D dude, <laughs> thank you so much for that. That oh, is wow. awesome. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to do a channel member town hall just so all the new yeah. the 50 new members can come in and, and be part of a cha channel and member think, town hall. I think that also adds, I think, two more emoji slots too. Nice. Now with that many... Uh, Ray's got to get some more emojis made. Some uh, things. Get so, on that, Ray. Make dude, it a me. Gabe, thank you so much for that. That is incredibly <laughs> oh, generous no of you, dude. Reason. Thank you so much. Send me your scripts emoji. <laughs> uh, Calvin is saying Gabe is a voice actor. Oh, nice. Oh, too bad Chris is in here. You'd be yeah. one of Chris's favorite people for that. Again, thank you so much for that. That's incredibly awesome of you, man. Thank you so much. All right. What's next? Speaking of members, we're going to move on to the member nice. questions. Uh, Majork says, Sony making the right choice not showing their face at CinemaCon. They'd make, uh, they'd get laughed out of the building. Maybe they knew Madam Web was going to be that bad. Again, <clears throat> people forget how much truly good stuff Sony's put out in the last while. And, and, you know, we got this new Ghostbusters coming that a lot of people are very excited about. Um, they have just completely and listen even their spider-man stuff everybody forgets they have far more wins with their spider-man stuff than they've got losses like for every morbius which is terrible and madam web which is terrible <laughs> for every one of those that they have they've got an into the spider-verse and across the spider-verse um they've got i mean i i don't care what other people i, I thought venom look at the, the audience ratings venom i thought was wonderful i had a really good time with it you know they've got and then of course that goes without saying the other spider-man films they've got more wins than losses um when does ghostbusters come out does it come out before or I after comic-con probably before comic -Con. in the meantime I, also miko just gifted five members. oh thank, so thank you, you miko appreciate that man so much 55 new channel members today that's amazing actually uh, 57 today by the way uh just just to let you guys know march 22nd uh as jonathan just said that we're now on the because we shut down the super chats we're now on our member one of the benefits of our channel members is that every day they get to send in questions for free we don't get around to all of them but we get through most of them every mm -hmm. day and that's one of the benefits of a channel being a channel member so thank you guys for that all right anyway what's next dr stinky uh figured out my f top five films of all time okay uh one is titanic two is interstellar three is shawshank redemption four godfather five citizen kane bring on this stinky all-time greats <laughs> i still remember the first time i went to go see <laughs> titanic was simply because my girl at the time wanted to see Titanic. I had no interest in seeing a leader. Not remember, this was a different time. I had no interest in seeing Leonardo DiCaprio, and oh, I didn't care. And then watch the movie. I'm like, holy crap! This movie is a masterpiece. It's it's amazing. And one of the one of the movies that is tied with Lord of the Rings: Return of the King as the most Academy Awards ever in history. It won eleven. Um, and it's totally deserved. And much like James Cameron's other film, Avatar, it became the cool thing to bash on, like, Titanic. It became the cool thing to bash on Avatar. But the reality is Titanic is a fucking great movie. Would it's rather, really good. It's also the only movie I remember where somebody actually uses the word melancholy in a sentence. <laughs> I would actually watch Titanic other than, uh, rather than The Notebook. I have like the longest streak of first date beauty. movies. It's The they Notebook. Why, so Three melancholy. straight girls that I dated. Three straight first, wow. first dates first were dates notebooks. Was the notebook. 
But that's a good one to take them to. I, I don't even remember the movie at all. <laughs> no, and I'm not saying that to be like, oh, I don't remember the movie. I don't. It's just been so long ago. I don't remember the movie at all. Uh, also, thank you, Patrick Stewart. This is a very giving day. Oh, 20. Uh, 20%. Wow. You guys are allowing me to use my new soundboard today. Dude, like, do we even have enough people in? Like, we've got over 2,500 yeah. people in the live chat. So, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty to go around. Yes. I was going to say, do we even have enough people in the live chat to receive these free memberships? That's awesome, dude. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, man. That's awesome. All, All right. right. What's next? Uh, mean says, which performances from Dune would have gotten an Oscar nom if the film hadn't been delayed? Uh, who would they replace? I think Timothy and Rebecca would get nominated for sure. I still think Killian would win. That's a good point. I actually think Killian would still win over Timothy. I do too. Yes, that's one of the categories. I mean, easily Dune 2 wins Best Picture. Like, sorry to everybody, to all the Oppenheimer defenders. And I am an Oppenheimer defender. I'm looking forward to it winning Best Picture at the Oscars this Sunday. I'm super excited about it. But yeah, it would, it would, it would get trounced by Dune 2. But... I agree Timothy will get a nomination, but I also agree Killian would still win. Um, but sorry, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, because sorry. Javier sorry. Bardem. He did that in so Canadian. <laughs> Javier Bardem yeah, as man. Stilgar. A hundred percent. I... Listen, I came out... Don't... don't. That's no, no diss on Robert Downey. I came... Did I not come out of Oppenheimer and go... Robert Downey Jr. is going to get nominated for Best Supporting Actor yeah. for this. Like I, I was like, I'm. A, it's one of his finest performances. But Javier Bardem would win Best Supporting Actor this year, I think, if, if that were to come about. Um, other than that, I don't think Rebecca Ferguson wins over uh, uh, Lily Gladstone or uh, Emma Stone for that. I think she gets nominated. I don't think she wins, and so. Yeah, I think it would be the the Javier Bardem show, uh, kind of. But but we'll never find out. We'll never find out. Uh, and thank you to Doctor Stinky for five John Candy <laughs> memberships. I, I, and thank you. Be closing in on a hundred new members and, today. Well, and thank you to Patrick Stewart for twenty. That Campion puts it over. That puts it over over a hundred new channel members today. Here, man. Thank you to Mister I. Are we getting trolled in some way? <laughs> <laughs> Are we getting free membership, Charles? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, right, this, you guys. This name is pretty great. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, Miss. That's uh, awesome. Dude, so, guys, thank you so much. This yeah, isn't even like you. a membership drive or anything. This is, this is. Look, I, I'll, I'll go and say it. Other than when we first launched channel memberships, this has to be the biggest new channel member sign up day that we've ever had. Crazy. Other than when we launched. Yeah, thank you guys Crazy. so much. Yep. That's awesome. Um, Dominic Suma, how much better, if any, would the prequels have been if George Lucas hired a different, uh, good to very good director uh, to direct each of the three films? Infinitely better. <laughs> Yeah. And, and here's why I say that. Because I still contend as awful smelling piles of shit garbage that the prequels are. That if you sit down, I've said this for decades, if you sit down and just read, say, a three page synopsis, a three page outline of what the prequels would be. There is the making for some great movies in that three. Just if you just look at an outline, it's like this could be awesome. And I really do think that Lucas, I understand why Lucas did wanted to do it himself, fully understand why. But I really do believe that if he had just let somebody else direct, um, and that they could have turned out infinitely better. And Rob, I think. The prequels are a cautionary tale when when all the when the it's the cool thing to say the studio should just give the director all the power to do whatever they want. <laughs> That's what you end up with. Uh, That's did, what you end up with. You know, do that again? <laughs> John, I was given the script for Phantom Menace like six months before the movie came out. And I was told by the person who gave it to me who was a huge Star Wars fan, you gotta read the script. It's fantastic. Reads good. Give yeah, put put your Star Wars soundtrack on and read the script. And he was right. Yeah. Essentially, it was the same movie, exactly the same movie, but everything like I did not picture Jake Lloyd as the kid. Jar Jar Binks on paper did not come off at all the way he came off sure. in the movie. And the way the Gungans talked, so I read it like it was a Star Wars movie. Whereas I think George Lucas, the real problem is that George Lucas had kind of, he had lost touch with 
humanity being George Lucas. He couldn't <laughs> he couldn't go to a Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. You know, he was George F. and Lucas. And he had forgotten what it meant, and he was so enamored of the technology and was doing all these things that he couldn't see the forest through the trees. You know, the big problem, Ron Howard it really explains what the problem is. Ron Howard talks about when he was working with George Lucas on, uh, what, what's the car movie? He America, no, uh, the, the one he did before. American Charles. Graffiti. American Graffiti, that's right. And Ron Howard said, you know, George Lucas went up to him while they were making American Graffiti and said, oh, I, I hear you're, you want to become director, he says to Ron Howard, who went on to become one of our great directors. He says, yeah. And George Lucas said to him, Ron Howard tells a story. He said, George told me, go into animation. That way you don't have to work with actors. <laughs> yeah. You can just do whatever you want to do. You don't have to work with actors. And Ron Howard's like, in my head, I'm thinking, you do know I'm one of your actors. And you're like talking to me. But that really, like George, <laughs> like just kind of sees actors as props, right? And it's really just all about- As, as the, wooden, you might even say. <laughs> yeah. Now listen, I have never, and I'm not going to say never- very rarely in my life has I disliked a movie or set of movies and yet really thought it had a strong story. The underlying story yeah. of the prequels is quite good. And it just, yeah, they just got lost. Nobody, I mean, nobody in that movie, nobody in the, in the prequels, all three of them, nobody talks like they're actual real people people like the real yeah. <laughs> human water? beings so well because no so to george it didn't matter yeah it, did, it, didn't, it didn't matter, matter. and so the conversations people have with one another you're like each one of them's like on a totally different planet they're, even though they're having the conversation with one another you don't believe one word that comes out of anyone's mouth or how it's delivered like you don't believe a character like jar jar binks it's too easy to crack on him but why does he speak the way he speaks why does he speak that way? A, 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 a creature would never speak that way. Somebody would have hit him in the face when he was a young kid, a young Gungan before. And, and so when he's talking that way, you're like, why is this character speaking like this? I don't know if you remember this, but back before The Phantom Menace came out, my buddy, uh, Paul Lenz, who went on to become a uh, director, not a movie director, but management level, he was a director at uh, LucasArts. He was the director of LucasArts. And he did some stuff, but before he went to run Lucasfilm Online, um, he and I worked together for a while on a on a on a company. But he ran the number one at the time Star Wars fan site in the world called the Force.net. Oh yeah. And while Paul was running the Force.net, and this was still like eight months or a year before the Phantom Menace came out, somebody leaked to him the audio clip of the scene of when Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and uh, Jar Jar were in the sub, and they're being attacked by the monster. All leaking, no power? When do you think we are gonna be in trouble? Like, when that line came out, and he was the first one to get it, and I remember, I was at his place, because we had a weekly risk game with some other buddies, and he's like, I honestly don't know if we should release this. Like, I, I cause I can't believe this is real. This, cause this is ridiculous. So they posted it, and the reaction was quick and harsh. Now, Twitter wasn't around. Facebook wasn't. I don't think Facebook was around yet. But the response to that when that first came out, it was like everybody just thought the world was ending. It's like everybody just lost hope right there just from hearing that voice. It was crazy. And, and if you all don't know what Risk is, that's the true gangster game. All right? Dude, it's the greatest, it's board, greatest board game, game of, of all time. time. <laughs> greatest yes, board it is. game of all time. Yes, it is. Yep, 100%. <laughs> and Patrick's just gifted 10 more memberships. My God. It's going to cross over to another channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. YouTube just pushes it to other channels. All right, sorry, went off on a went off on a, uh, a rabbit trail there. Okay, what's next? All right, well, we got Captain Kirk here who says, oh. "I'll eventually come up with something, but just wanted to say hi. Started my bachelor's for IT with nice. the University of Phoenix Online. Uh, it's going to be daunting task, but you can do it. You, you can. can. You know, it, one of the great things about education today with modern technology is that it's it's accessible to more people because exactly. the ability to do it virtually. Exactly. Like my my wife right now is 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 a doctorate student she's taking her doctorate she's going to be actually one year from next week she's going to be dr ann campia but she's been doing the usc that's dr ann campia right there um 
But she she's doing it through USC. <laughs> it's all by. been virtual. <laughs> <laughs> she's taken all that and she's teaching for the University of California Riverside and actually teaches a, a university uh, program and she does it virtually as well. And it's just like opened up to make education even more accessible for people. And I think that is, <laughs> I love you, that. They uh, eliminated one of the big parts about like drawbacks is like going to campus, like the drive. They just, yeah, they, it made it way more accessible. Yeah, they got you closer to your goals, like right there. All right. What's next? All right, we got um, Dan Salient who says, saw Japan's international film submission. Oh, I just saw this two days ago. Uh, Perfect Days the other day. Beautiful film, all about how important it is for us as people to appreciate each day because any day could be our last. Which I saw it get a lot of hate from people who never even saw it because they were like, Godzilla minus one should have been the nominee. Oh, and listen, boy. besides all the issues, we won't even go into all the issues that are, are behind all that. But... Uh, how how classic film fandom right let's trash on a movie we never saw because i wanted something else to get it it's like uh. you also have to understand i mean as much as we all love godzilla minus one it's not exactly an academy movie you're fighting against godzilla's reputation all the way back to 1954. yeah come on yeah all right what's next uh we got cj rebirth uh who says do you ever just take a moment to think what exactly did the rock mean when he told samuel L. jackson <laughs> aim for the bushes <laughs> that's a classic line from the great comedy the other guys i with love will ferrell and and mark Wahlberg. that was mark Wahlberg, right yeah yeah oh and eva longoria yeah and 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 the captain was uh uh, uh keaton yeah oh, that's right it was michael keaton michael keaton <laughs> aim for the bush i remember for a, a a while they actually said they were looking at trying to develop a spin-off movie of the Samuel Jackson, Dwayne Johnson characters. If, like for a good year, they were trying to get that put together and made. Wasn't the other team too? I love the other team. It was Damon Wayne's Jr. And that one guy that- I don't eat, even eat remember. By the, nuts. the guy in the- uh, uh, The other guy's uh, in, the, in the precinct? The Step Brothers. <laughs> Rob <laughs> Riggle? Yeah, yeah, it was him I and don't Damon even Wayne remember Jr. him in that. Yeah, yeah, they were the other team. Because remember, the top team was <laughs> yeah, Samuel yeah, Jackson and Rock. <laughs> and then they died, so- <laughs> or whatever Aim and then the it was bushes. Mark Wahlberg yeah I love that movie yeah well well John the, Jonathan this gives you the opportunity oh, to okay. use this because if somebody says aim for the bushes that's what she said it's playing they heard it okay <laughs> <laughs> all right what's next all right also thank you Fernando and thank you also uh boiled Odin productions <laughs> for, for five so that's six more Jeez. this is freaking like sponsorship day it, it seems guys. like everyone in the world got tax refunds except me <laughs> except me <laughs> except me is that what we're using it on good job all right what's uh, next okay so uh jeff stein says do you uh do you think negotiations between the studios and ILC will get resolved in time to avoid a some a strike i i have one i think so yes they better because they complain so much about the writers and and the actors and they're like we need money we need to be working we got our stuff together and then for them to come out and be like oh we're striking now too but i hope i i hope so now i've got um you know it really sucks too because when the when the writers and the actors were on strike and again if if you are in labor negotiations and you feel you're getting a raw deal you strike i i have no problem no problem with that but i'm just saying we also forget that when they decided to strike it affected a lot of other people including the members of iatsi and they were like I, our my friend spencer and laura we had spencer on the show with us because he's a production designer. His wife, uh, Laura, one of Anne's very best friends, is a the unit set photographer for a lot of Netflix shows and, and stuff like that. They, were, they weren't on strike, but they were out of work for like six months. Yep. Now their contract is coming up, and I hope if things get kind of sticky, I really hope the actors and writers decide to show them a little support. But we should have... Um, Spencer and Laura on again to talk about this time because Spencer did a great job a number of years ago really laying out what the issues were when it looked like IATSE might strike. Yeah, I, I think it would be really great for us to bring them on again to kind of talk about the issues at hand this time around. Yeah, I agree. But they have to because without them, because <laughs> guess what? When the writers alone were on strike, Hollywood productions were still happening. If IATSE goes on strike, everybody's <laughs> fucked. Yeah. Nothing can happen in this town. The industry does. It, yeah, it's not going to survive. Down. Yeah. It's... They, so they better work this out. They have to work this out. And another five members. 
Patrick's done like 40. 75, I think. If it's 50, then 20 and well, I don't 25. Did, I, Patrick was the one who There are others, too, oh. but we're up to but I mean, I think Patrick himself might have been <laughs> from, 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 from the command chair of the Enterprise D bridge. Patrick we're well Stewart. over yeah. 100 new, new uh, yeah, channels, channel members today. <laughs> we're actually going to have to try now. Yeah, we got to, yeah, now we got to put some effort into this. All right, we got time for a couple more. What's right. next? Uh, Gogef says, favorite actor role against their normal type. Mine has always been Robert De Niro in Stardust. Robert De Niro. Yeah, that's so okay, good. first of all, I, I, it, it brings a ray of joyous sunshine to my heart whenever somebody brings up Stardust. Stardust is great. It is my most, I think, the most underappreciated movie ever made. I, I'm not saying it's the best movie ever made. But I think it is the most underappreciated. Robert De Niro, um, Ricky Gervais, Henry Cavill, uh, 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 Daredevil, uh, Charlie Michelle Cox, uh, Claire Danes, um, just on and on and on and on. It, it's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant movie. I have an answer for this question, though. Oh. Tyler Perry in Gone Girl. Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Like that one? Nice yep. grab right yeah. there. Yeah. Got was, that rebound, that was baby. really good. Um, I I, this, I mean, I, this is a great question, I but it's one I'd questions. have to actually think about. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm sure there have been many, but I, it's something I would have to actually sit down and think about. But yeah, it's a great one. That's a great one. All right. What's next? All right. Joel, wrong one. Joel Checky says, I believe the Bene Gesserit series for Max is now called Dune Prophecy, and the cast includes Mark Strong, Emily Watson, and Travis Fimmel. Ooh. Travis, who was in the lead, the lead guy in the Vikings series. Uh, I think we heard about Mark Strong a while ago. I think mm -hmm. we, we heard about that. I didn't hear about it being titled Prophecy. But, Rob, I don't know if you heard when David Zaslav the other day was talking about we've got some great stuff coming up this year. He mentioned the new season of Hacks, which I've never watched, but everybody who has watched it says The new trailer looks amazing. good. The, um, uh, House what was of the Dragon? What's that? House of the Dragon. I don't know. I yeah, don't House know. of the Dragon. Okay. That's right. The second one was House of the Dragon. And then the other one he mentioned was Dune, which does that imply it's going to come out by the end of the year? I, I was in that quarter. I, I would I mean, hope they would, yeah. you know, keep you the momentum going. You still excited for this? You know, <laughs> look, look, I, I, no, no, I think the idea, the fact that they fired the showrunner and started basically from scratch does not give me a lot of hope. This ain't no the thing is, I want, no, I want a, a show. This show should be the. Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon of the Dune universe. I just don't have faith that it's going to be that. The, the fact that they they didn't know what it was and they had to get rid of the creative team shows that they probably went into this and didn't think it through. I hope it's great. I want it to be great. And I like the fact that it's called Prophecy because the Benny Gesserit Sisterhood, is the, the, they made all this stuff up. It That's what they do is they create these prophecies and seed them into cultures on their way to creating the Kwisak Hadrak. It doesn't help that it's coming off of what you say, the greatest movie, sci-fi movie you've seen in the past 10 years. Yeah. It doesn't help that it has to piggyback off yeah, of that. Yeah, it's got huge shoes now. Huge shoes. But let's also call this, too. Max has been killing it, right? They, I mean, Penguin is coming out, Yeah, right? Do you watch yeah. The Regime with Kate not Winslet? Yet. No, yet. I have not. I, I, I enjoyed the first episode. Oh, really? God, People I have been her. like kind of like whatever about it, but... I thought it was funny. But I liked that, it. that House of the Dragon. She's so sexy. In a um, like it's just it, they've been really kind of killing it. So I I'm gonna go in optimistically. I mean it's not Denis doing it, but I'm gonna go in with optimism. And all right, guys, that's all the time we've got today. So that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. A big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions and who gifted memberships. Uh, number one, because he gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, he supported this channel as you did it and all of us involved with the show. Thank you guys so much for your support. Two interesting programming notes I want to let you guys know about. First of all, later this afternoon at about 4.15 p.m. Los Angeles time, we're going to be doing an open mic. So if you feel like just hanging out and talking more about movies more casually, come on back and join me in about three hours, three hours or so from now for the next installment of Open Mic. But also, how's this? Tomorrow will be the first time in about a year that we're going to have Robert Meyer Burnett and Chris Carr 
on with joining me on an, together on an episode Ooh, of the why? John Game Show podcast. Yeah. So we'll look forward to that. Hope you guys will come back and join us for that. So for Ray Aura, yeah, Jonathan Voico, writer, director, producer Robert Meyer Burnett, one land, one king. <laughs> my name's John Campia. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. And until next time, my friends. Bye bye.